morning everyone shalom praise the lord welcome to all our um, online students ravili and nina john for uh, joining us this morning and also to our e learning students who will be listening to the lectures later on uh, and a welcome to also our in person students um this morning we will begin looking at uh, the second publication for this course um it's kingdom Go kingdom of god and kingdom builders so we looked at uh, kingdom builders we studied kingdom builders uh, we'll begin studying um uh, sorry we we studied the kingdom of god we will begin studying kingdom builders uh, from uh, today i've posted uh, the pdf copy of um, the kingdom builders in the uh, google stream page so you all can access it um, um, online students and our in person students have the um, publication with them so we'll begin i'll ask um, nikhil to lead us in prayer please father we thank you for this wonderful The online students were able to access the um, uh, PDF uh, copy on the the Google Stream page. Okay, uh, we'll we'll uh, begin looking at uh, this publication, Kingdom Builders. Uh, we'll have to finish this before uh, the end of November, our last class. So it's going to be <laughs> it's going to be quite a race. Um, the first chapter is the kingdom and the church, and uh, it's just um, three pages. So, and it's a repetition of all that I have been actually speaking and teaching the last uh, two, 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 two and a half months, three months. Okay, so I'm not looking at chapter one because it's it's a repetition of um, what we had studied in um, the kingdom of God. We look at chapter two this morning. Okay, but I would like you all to read chapter one because it just reiterates all the truths that um, uh, you have been taught these this last uh, two months uh, from the publication, um, um, The Kingdom of God. Okay, we look at chapter two, Christ, uh, the King of the Kingdom. So as Christ, as the King of the Kingdom, we will be looking at um, how we can be kingdom builders. So we uh, studied all about the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. And we looked at various aspects of the kingdom of God in the first publication that we studied. Okay. Uh, we also learned that we belong to the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, and we are part of it. And even as we belong and we are part of the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven, we are co-laborers and we are co-partnering with God in building his kingdom okay so in this publication uh, kingdom builders which we are studying this morning um you know we will study different aspects of kingdom building basically how we will look at how to be a kingdom a builder and various other aspects of kingdom building okay so for those of you who just joined in we are uh, begin beginning to study um, the other publication kingdom uh, builders this morning Okay, uh, we are not looking at chapter one because chapter one is already a, a, a repetition of what we had studied in the publication, The Kingdom of God. So I'm not going to repeat everything because it's all repeated very often in my lectures in the past few lectures. So I'd like you all to read uh, chapter one. We'll, we'll look at chapter two this um, morning. Okay, and in chapter two, it talks about uh, that Christ is the king of the kingdom. And as Christ uh, being the king of the kingdom, which we already studied, how do we relate 
uh, with this truth, um, keeping this in mind, how do we um, uh, relate to his kingdom and how can we build his kingdom? So in this publication, we're basically looking at how we can be kingdom builders and various aspects of kingdom building. Okay, So one person who we can look at who was a good kingdom builder, who can we look at as a good kingdom builder in the New Testament? The Apostle Paul, okay, he was mightily used by God uh, to establish and expand the kingdom of God. Sorry, Nina, uh, you were saying something? Okay. Even Jesus, you know, we can look up to him as somebody who um, was a good kingdom builder. He was the one who came and initiated the kingdom, but also was a kingdom builder. Okay. So we look at um, how God, you know, uh, Apostle Paul was used mightily by God to establish and expand the kingdom of God. And he was a true kingdom builder. Okay. So in his various episodes he talks about how to be a true kingdom builder okay so we look at one such passage so can one of you please read first corinthians chapter 3 um verses 6 and verses 9 to 11. Uh, first corinthians chapter 3 verse 6 9 to 11. i planned apollos watered but god gave the increases for we are god's fellow workers you are God's field. You are God's building. According to the grace of God, which was given to me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation and another builds on it. But let each one take heed how he builds on it. For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is led, which is Jesus Christ. Amen. So here we see uh, several important things. Uh, Paul says that the church represents a field of many co-workers, okay, who are cooperating with each other to reap a harvest. And a church is uh, a lot like buildings where walls are being raised up together. You know, many, many builders, many men, women work to raise up these walls. So the walls are raised up together by co-workers. And so he compares the church to God's field and God's building. Okay, so we are God's field and our job must be to grow and harvest and not to quarrel with each other and not to fight who is the greatest and who is the best and who is the powerful okay so therefore being co-workers with god means that we work together as one unit okay to achieve what god desires um even as we are part of kingdom building and even as we are building his church okay so we are co-workers with the king and this is what makes us kingdom builders Okay, and we are working with him and we are working in partnership together with him and in partnership and togetherness with others to build people who are his kingdom. Okay, so kingdom building is not I, me, myself doing everything by myself, but kingdom building is co-working with God and co-working together with others. And who are we building? We are not building our empire. We are not building our own name, fame, power, our uh, business, uh, you know, but we are actually building people. That is very important to keep in mind. Sometimes when we get into kingdom building, we get so caught up and carried away that we think that kingdom building is about, you know, building my own empire, my own business, you know, uh, even if it's church or ministry you know, um, the, uh, building a name, fame, a reputation for myself. No, it is building people and it is co-working together with God and others. We need each other, okay? So, um, uh, we, um, and that is why we should not quarrel with uh, each other and God desires that, you know, we do this in unity and oneness okay so we are co-workers with the king and that is what makes us as kingdom builders okay and each one of us has to be he each one of us has a part in kingdom building okay so each one of us has our own work and it's regardless of what it is it is equally 
important. Whether you are an apostle, a pastor, a missionary, or whether you are a Sunday school teacher or a children's church teacher, or somebody who's just serving tea or coffee, whatever it is, each one of us have our work in the kingdom of God. And regardless of what it is, each one of us, uh, each one of our work is equally important. That means everyone is equally important in the kingdom of God. Okay. And as kingdom builders, our relationship with the king is of prime importance. Okay. So Jesus is the king of the, this kingdom. And in kingdom building, we need to understand that our relationship with the king is of utmost importance. Okay. Look at what 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 11 says. It says, For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Christ Jesus. So in kingdom building, we must remember <clears throat> that who is the foundation? Jesus Christ, which means everything begins with him. Okay. And he is the head. He is the preeminent one, which means, you know, he is supreme. He is authority. Okay. So since he is the foundation and he is the head, so it is very important for us to have a relationship with the king and with the one who is the head okay sometimes we think that kingdom in kingdom building um you know it is important for us to have relationships or connect with bigger churches you know bigger pastors leaders influential people yes it's important for us to have healthy relationships with fellow ministers with other believers with other pastors with other uh, churches but what really qualifies us to be good kingdom builders is first our relationship with the king. So sometimes we miss out on that. We forget that. We forget that our relationship with God is more important because he is the king of this kingdom. But we run around and try to, you know, uh, associate us with, uh, associate ourselves with denominations, um, with bigger organizations, with bigger pastors, you know, come under the banner, come under the spiritual covering, so to say, so that we can receive from them. It's good to receive, <clears throat> but it's important that, you know, who is the king? Jesus. He is the one who pours into our lives. He's the one who gives us the anointing. He's the one who leads us. He's the one who, um, you know, directs us. He's the one who shows us what we need to do and how we need to build the kingdom. Okay. Look at what Colossians chapter 1 verses 16 to 18 says. Can somebody read that please? Colossians 1, 6 to 18. For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may, he may have the preeminence. Amen. So in kingdom building, we must remember that all things are by him, for him, and through him, who is the him here? Jesus, okay? And in all things, he must be preeminent. That means in all things, he must be foremost, he must be the leader, he must be the number one, okay? So Christ should hold the highest and supreme position in every aspect of the believer's life, okay? And he is to be esteemed, he is to be honored, acknowledged above all. If not, then the work we do, you know, uh, or the ministry we do cannot be considered as Christ's kingdom. It cannot be considered as building Christ's kingdom. It will be considered as building our own kingdom or it will be considered as building somebody else's kingdom. Okay. So if at the end of our ministry or, you know, when we do some ministry or we do some program or we do some conference or, you know, we have some prayer meeting or, uh, you know, after preaching in a service, you know, if people get more excited about us as a person, you know, 
uh, our charm, our way of speaking, the way we, you know, we told the stories, the way we spoke, our um, uh, charisma, whatever, you know, people get more excited about us than God and his word. It means that whatever we have done, whatever program we have done, whatever conference, whatever prayer meeting, you know, whatever uh, ministry we have done, whatever preaching, it has not served in a true sense of building God's kingdom okay and um, uh, uh, you and i have not served as true kingdom builders so as kingdom builders we need to understand that kingdom building is all about building christ's kingdom okay it's not about my ministry it's not about my church it's not about my you know, sometimes when uh, we share the gospel and uh, people accept and uh, we mentor them, we, they, we think they belong to me, to us. You know, we take authority of their, over their lives. If they do something without telling us, we get very, very upset. You know, we think it's our sheep, you know. So it's not my sheep. It's not my church. It's not my ministry. It's not even your ministry. It's not even your church. The kingdom of God neither belongs to me or to you it's not mine or yours it's about his kingdom okay because he is the king of the kingdom look at what matthew chapter 6 verse 10 says it says your kingdom come your will be done on earth at, as it is in heaven so it's our desire to see whose kingdom come his kingdom not my kingdom come and not my will be done and not my ministry to come we need to remember that very very clear uh, clearly and that's very very subtly that satan can bring us about or our own selfish desires and you know before long we can get you know we'll be ruined or we can uh, you know ruin the ministry of the calling that god has called us to do so we are here on earth to do what god wants to be done on the earth not what i want to do and god in heaven expresses his will and he's looking up to us as his people who are kingdom builders to execute or to do his will here on earth so it's not my will it's not what i want to do through my ministry whether i'm running catalyst or you know, writing children's church curriculum or uh, you know doing uh, teaching in bible college it's only what god wants to do in and through all of these ministries okay and we must seek to glory as kingdom builders we must seek to glorify god alone okay matthew 6 verse 13 the second part of the verse says for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever amen so as kingdom builders our purpose must be very very clear what should be our purpose our purpose should be doing god's will Okay, and our purpose should that God alone should be glorified in every aspect of our ministry and every, every aspect of our life. So we should desire um, that, you know, we don't receive any glory, but God deserves all the glory, not even a small portion, the glory for ourselves. And this can be very, very subtle. Okay, we can get deceived very easily because some of us think, hey, I'm, I'm leading worship or I'm singing or I'm playing the instrument or I'm teaching, I'm preaching and I'm an apostle, I'm a minister, I ha you know, have a church, I have a Bible study group, I, I'm a powerful evangelist, which is all good, you know, and, uh, and we, we think that we are giving God the glory. So sometimes we can give God 90% of the glory, but 10% of the glory we want for ourselves. So how do we know that we are seeking glory? We think uh, nobody told me I sang well. Nobody told me that the uh, worship was powerful or the preaching was so powerful. Um, you know, um, nobody's recognizing me. Nobody's acknowledging me. So, you know, that is, you know, or if somebody tells you, gives you some feedback, you get very, very upset. You get very annoyed. You get very angry. You know, how can that person tell me okay so all of this is basically seeking glory for ourselves even sometimes we would give god 90 percent of the glory but we want 10 percent or even five percent so it can be what i'm saying is it's very very subtle you know and we can think oh i'm giving god all the glory but there is 10 percent deep down so sometimes we need to even not even we have to kill that 10 percent crucify that flesh in that part of the eighth sun so even if you don't receive any recognition nobody says good job well done so blessed so powerful so anointed and all of those things you just you know 
seek for more of God's anointing and more power that people's lives be um, touched. Okay, so we shouldn't draw attention for ourselves. It's not because of our. Sometimes we think it's our our words, our power, our charisma, the way we speak, the way we have the style of speaking, you know, all of that. It's not our characters, it's not our words, it's not our virtue, it's not our charisma, that wonderful things happen, you know. Um, um, you know, sometimes we see that even our words, our ministry reports, our testimonies can all be geared up to, pe you know, people fixing their eyes on. Us. So sometimes we say, I went here, I went there, I preached, you know, the 100 people came to the conference and uh, all of them accepted Jesus Christ, all of them were powerfully touched and all of those. So exaggeration, which is all, you know, uh, is looking up, people are looking up at us and saying, oh, so powerful, so wonderful. Okay. So uh, like Peter and John, you know, who went to the temple and they saw the lame man and the lame man was begging for money when Peter and John said in the name of Jesus rise up and stand and then when you know he stood up and he was leaping and jumping and praising God everyone was so amazed and they were so marveled that they were looking at Peter and John like as if they say God had come down on earth so what does Peter and uh, John tell them in Acts chapter 3 verse 12 he says why do you marvel at us like this? Or why do you look so intently, you know, as though it is through our own power or through our godliness that we made this man, lame man, walk? And then they point, point out to the living God uh, who, who is Jesus Christ. Okay. So sometimes we pray for that people looking at us, giving that kind of attention, giving that kind of, uh, oh, so good, so nice. And we are so happy, you know, but look at Peter and John, they quickly identified it and they pointed, you know, they said, don't look at us. It's not our power or godliness, but it is Jesus. Okay. They point out to Jesus. So we need to move away from a place of receiving glory for ourselves, a place where we're giving God all the glory so sometimes it's you know it's as human beings we will think hey nobody came and told me how i led worship nobody told me how i preached you know nobody clapped for me nobody said anything at that time what you need to do is yes we are human we can think like that but you know you must need to quickly cut those thoughts and say god you know i just crucify these thoughts i i don't want to receive glory for myself i just believe what you have laid on my heart what you have asked me to do the skills the talents you've given to me i have just uh, gone ahead and done it you just touch and impact people's lives okay so we it's only when we truly seek that god be glorified you know will our hearts be pure and there will be no unrighteousness in us so one way to keep our hearts pure and one way that there is no unrighteousness to be found in us is to truly seek in every aspect of our life that God be glorified. How do we know this? John chapter 7 verse 18. Can somebody read that please? John chapter 7 verse 18. He who speaks for himself seeks his own glory. But he who seeks the glory of the one who sent him is true. And no unrighteousness is in him. Amen. So here we see that, you know, those who seek the glory of one who sent him is true. And there's no unrighteousness in him. Okay, so let's look at First Thessalonians chapter two. Uh, First Thessalonians chapter two, verses four to six. Can somebody read that, please? First Thessalonians chapter two, verses four to six. But as we have been approved by God to be interested, interested with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God who tests our hearts. For neither at any time do, uh, did we use flattering words, as you know, nor a cloak for covetousness. God is witness. Nor did we seek glory from men, either from you or from others. Yeah, so here we see that the motivation of our hearts, even as we preach and teach and minister, should always be to please God and not man. Okay. And if we do this in this way, you know, um, 
where we are seeking glory for God and not for man, then we know that our hearts are pure and there is no unrighteousness in us. Okay, So we need to also remind ourselves that this king of this kingdom is a jealous and a zealous God. He's a jealous God. He will not tolerate his glory to go to anyone else. And we know that we read this in Isaiah chapter 42 verse 8. He says, I am the Lord and this is my name and my glory I will give I will not give it to anyone else or give it to any other, nor my praise to carved images. Okay, so we see that uh, the God that we serve is a God who is a jealous God and who will not tolerate his glory to be given to anyone else. Okay, so let's look at what Jesus said about giving God all the glory and not looking to receive honor from men. Jesus said in John chapter 5, verse 41, he says, I do not receive honor from men. Okay, so we need to come to a place before God where we do not desire honor from men, but desire honor only from God. Okay, when we live to receive applause from heaven and not wanting applause or you know, uh, uh, from men, from men, that's when we are truly seeking to glorify God. Okay, look at what uh, Jesus says in John chapter eight, verse fifty-four. Can somebody read that, please? John chapter eight, verse fifty-four. John chapter five, verse fifty-four. How can you? Eight, dear. Eight okay. fifty-four. Jesus answered, "If I honor myself, my honor is nothing." Read honor that is. No? Okay. Okay. Honor that is self-bestowed is not true honor and is devoid of any value. Okay. So our hearts must be totally void, empty of any desire or praise from man. Okay. And that is who a true kingdom builder is. So the what is the real test to know whether our hearts are really pure, whether our hearts are not seeking glory uh, for men or not looking for glory for ourselves? Uh, the real test is, uh, you know, uh, uh, is when, you know, um, when we are willing to risk you know, uh, or two situations where we're willing to even risk losing out on acceptance of man and even face rejection, okay? So even if we face rejection, even if we face shame, even if we are in a place where, you know, uh, we risk losing acceptance or a recognition, it's when we, we know that we are in a place where our hearts are pure and righteous, where we are not seeking praise of men, but we are seeking honor and we are seeking God alone to be um, glorified. Okay. Um, look at what um, Jesus says in regarding this in John chapter 12, verses 42 to 43. John chapter 12, verses 42 to 43. John chapter 12, 42, 43. Never believe even among the rulers. Many be believed in him, but because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue. Yeah, so look at what happens here. You know, the many rulers believed in Jesus Christ, but that he was a son of God. But because of the fear of the acceptance of the Pharisees, that the Pharisees will not accept them. They will not be among these Pharisees. They will not be well known. They will not be recognized. And also because they will be put out of the synagogue, you know, they, uh, this, they, they did not confess him as God or did not confess him as the Messiah, even though they accepted him. So how do we really test that our hearts uh, you know, are pure with regard to not receiving praises of men or and just uh, receiving praise from God is when we choose in these kind of situations. Okay, we risk losing our acceptance by man, and we even can face rejection by man, but that does not matter to us because we are doing what God 
is is honoring God and what God is pleased um, with. Okay, uh, just and not be like these rulers who just because they wanted to be well known among the Pharisees, be friends with them, not be thrown out synagogue. They even though they believed in Jesus, they did not confess um, him. Okay. And how can we always also have a pure heart in regard to giving God all the glory in our life and ministry? You know, it's important for us to pray this prayer every day. Whatever is your area of skill and talent in the ministry, whether you are leading worship, whether you're playing an instrument, whether you're preaching, teaching, you're a pastor, you know, an evangelist, whatever, you know, you need to pray and ask God to remove you know, all of these things, these thorns that can be there, which can actually destroy your ministry, destroy your relationship with the king. So the psalmist in Psalm 115 verse 1 says, Not unto us, O Lord, not unto us, but your name give glory because of your mercy, because of your truth. So we need to pray often, you know, that God will keep our hearts pure and that um, will keep our hearts in the right direction. Okay. Another way that uh, we can truly be kingdom builders is that, you know, uh, we need to know that our authority on earth is dependent on our submission to the king. Okay. So the amount, the, the extent we, uh, uh, you know, are able to use God's power and authority is the extent that we are submissive and yielded to the king in this, in his kingdom look at what james chapter 4 verse 7 says can one of you read that please james 4 james uh, chapter 4 verse 7 therefore submit to god resist the devil and he will flee from you yeah so and our authority on earth is effective only to the extent that we are in submission to the king so we are first to submit to the king and it says submit to god then you can resist the devil Okay, sometimes we are battling Satan, we are fighting Satan, and we're thinking, hey, I'm not able to win. And how is it possible? You know, as a as a child of God, as a son and daughter of God, I have the authority, I have the power, you know, and some of you are wondering, but I'm not able to overcome Satan in this area or this temptation or this weakness. So what is the first thing we need to do? We need to submit to God. Okay, so uh, we see that in the Garden of Eden, there were two trees, right? The tree of? Okay, good and evil and the tree of life. Okay, so God told them not to eat from those trees. But when they ate from the tree of good and evil, their eyes were opened. Okay, they were empowered. Okay, um, and uh, God said, as far as you don't eat from these trees, you will have dominion on the earth. But when they disobeyed, what happened? They lost their dominion on the earth. They lost their authority on the earth. And who did they give their authority to? Satan. Okay. And all, as a result, they also lost access to the tree of life. So the extent we are we're coming under obedience and submission to the king of this kingdom, you know, is the extent that we will have authority in his kingdom. So the key to have authority in God's kingdom as a kingdom builder, if you want to have that power and that authority, the answer or the key is obedience and submission. Okay. So uh, um, spiritual authority is very simple. His dominion in me determines his dominion through me. Okay. Uh, some good statements here. His dominion in me determines his dominion through me or his authority the extent i i give, submit and he's author he uh, uh, he's uh, in authority in my life is the extent that his authority will flow through my life to the extent god reigns in me is the extent he can reign through me okay so when you are under authority you can exert the authority that you are submitted Okay, so if you want to be authoritative in God's kingdom, what is the answer? Submission and obedience. Okay, two very, very important things. And also, you know, as a kingdom builder, we should not let us not glory in man. Okay, look at uh, what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 11 to 13. Can somebody read that, please? 1 Corinthians chapter 
11 11 to 13. For it has been declared to me concerning you, my brethren, my those of Joe's household, that there are contentions. contentions among you. Now I say this, that each of you says, I am of Paul, or I am of Apollos, or I am of Cephas, or I am of Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? Amen. So 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 21 says, Therefore let no one boast in men, for all things are yours. Okay. Um, please read 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6. Now, these things, brethren, I have figuratively transferred to myself and Apollos for your sake, that you may learn in us uh, us to think beyond what is written, that none of you may be puffed up on behalf of one another, uh, behalf of one against the other. Yes. So while scripture teaches us that we need to respect and honor those in Christian leadership, those who teach the doctrine, uh, Paul writes to Timothy and says, you know, we need to give them double honor, honor to all believers, but double honor to those who specifically preach and teach the word and doctrine. We must, you know, we must respect them and honor them, but we must be careful not to become puffed up one on behalf of an or one or uh, sorry puffed up on behalf of one against an other okay so we should not elevate any man any individual beyond their rightful place but when we do that what happens you know it will produce divisions in the kingdom of god look at what paul is saying he's saying you know um uh you know, if some of you say, I'm of Paul, I'm of Apollos, I'm a Cephas, I'm of Christ. Is Christ divided? So it's basically saying, you know, when you say all of this, I belong to this person, I belong to that person, you're actually bringing in division in the church. It's producing division, okay? And when we do that, we are ceasing to become kingdom builders. Instead, we are becoming kingdom dividers, okay? And we need to be very, very careful, okay? Because in churches, we are seeing this. You know, there's a senior pastor, there are associate pastors, and suddenly, you know, people say, I don't want to listen to what the senior pastor says. I want to listen to what the associate pastor uh, says, okay? And the associate pastor becomes puffed up because everybody is liking the associate pastor then compared to the senior pastor, and it's becoming and becomes, brings about division in the body of Christ or in the kingdom of God, okay? So when you elevate yourself thinking that all things are happening in the ministry or in the church because of you or what you are doing, you are actually glorifying in man, okay? And also we see in the passages that we read, when you elevate yourself thinking that you are more spiritual or you're somebody more sensitive to God, more prayerful, more anointed than others, then you are glorifying in man. And it's a very dangerous place to be there, okay? Another thing we need to keep in mind as kingdom builders is that we're accountable to God who judges all things, okay? So let's look at two scripture passages, 1 Corinthians 4, 3 to 5. Can somebody read that? And also 2 Corinthians 5, 9 to 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 3 to 5. But with me, it is a very simple, small thing that I should be judged by you or by a human court. In fact, I do not even judge myself. For I know of nothing against myself, yet I am not justified by this. But he who judges me is the Lord. Therefore, judge nothing before the time until the Lord comes, who will both bring to light and the hidden things of darkness and reveal the counsels of the hearts. Then each one's praise will come from God. Second Corinthians chapter 5, verse 9 to 11. Therefore, we make it our aim, whether present or absent, to be well pleasing to him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are all well known to God, and I also trust are well known in your conscience. Conscience. Amen. 
Thank you. So while it's important to be accountable to those whom the Lord has placed around us, you know, it is even more accountable. Uh, it is even more important to be accountable to God. Okay. Ultimately, we are accountable to God who will judge all things. So what is accountability? Accountability is basically being true to God, true to yourselves, true to our family, true to those we serve and true to those who watch over our lives. Okay. So we will be judged not by the amount of things that we do or the ministry that we do or what we have accomplished, but God will judge us for our motives, why we did what we did. Okay. Um, uh, we, we will be judged with the motives with which we did things. So it's not how much we accomplished for the kingdom, but why we did what we did. We will also be judged not for the greatness of the things that we have done, but for our obedience to God's will. Sometimes we can do great things and all of those great things are because I wanted to do them. I felt I should be doing them. It is good for me to do it for the kingdom of God, but it is not in accordance with God's will or plan or purpose. Okay, so we will be judged for the, not for the greatness of the things we have done, but for our obedience, whether we have done the Father's will. Okay, and we will also be judged not by the significance of our calling or our gifting, but for the faithfulness with which we have done it. Okay, that is more uh, important. If you look at Revelation chapter 3, verses 1 to 2, you now the angel is talking about the church in Sardis, and he says, You know, I know your works that you have a name and that you are alive, but you are dead. So the, the angel is saying, Hey, great are your works at the church at Sardis. Many things, good things, great things you're doing, you know. Uh, and it looks like your church is very, very alive and active, but actually you are dead. Why are you dead? Because you are doing what you think you should be doing, okay, but you're not doing God's will. So it's, it's, it's possible that we have a reputation that we are found alive, we found at, uh, active, very energetic in the ministry, but we're actually de dead in God's sight, in God's judgment, in God's estimation, okay? It's possible for us to look like we are anointed men and women of God, you know, but it can also, we can also be in a place where we are actually doing things which people think we are anointed, but where actually God is being disappointed with us. I like the words that pastor has used, you know, um, possible for us to consider being anointed, but have it be, but, uh, you know, God being disappointed with us. Okay. So our desire should be that our work and ministry be perfect before God, which means doing what God wills, what he wants, he receiving the glory and doing it in total obedience and submission. And that is why even when Jesus did that on, you know, he finished the work on the cross and he resurrected, you know, there's no, may, no more payment for sin that was needed because Jesus paid the full sufficient and the perfect sacrifice and he pleased or appeased the wrath of God. Okay. So we need to develop a heart of a kingdom builder. What is a heart of a kingdom builder? A heart of a kingdom builder is a heart that is totally devoted to Christ, who is the king. You know, a, a heart that seeks the glory of God and the glory of the king alone, who is Jesus Christ. A heart that does not receive honor from man, but receives honor from God. A heart that does not glory in man, but glorifies in God. A heart that is pure in his, in its motives. And so our prayer as kingdom builders should be, God, create in me a heart that is a heart of a kingdom builder where you know all the kingdom building i i'm doing begins with you and ends with you because we we read the verses right christ is the foundation he's a preeminent one so you know we need to pray and ask god give me that heart of a kingdom builder and start praying it now you know even as you're in involved in in small ministries so some of you are involved uh, uh, in full-time ministry work or in, you know, even in doing a little ministry, important for us to pray this prayer, okay? So this is chapter 2. Anyone has any questions? Any questions? Okay. 
No questions? Okay. There are no questions. We will uh, move on to chapter two. Chapter three, sorry. Yeah. Chapter three. In chapter 3, we will be looking at the Holy Spirit, who is our director. Now, we you've already studied in depth the Holy Spirit, so uh, most of this is uh, quite a lot of content that is repetitive. So I'm just going to quickly go through it just to reiterate some important uh, truths. Before that, you know, before we look at um, the Holy Spirit who leads us and guides us in kingdom building, you know, uh, we we just looked at how important it is for us to do the Father's will. If we do the Father's will, we are rewarded not only here on earth, but also in eternity. Okay. So Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 to 23. Can somebody read that, please? Can give it to Sri Radha? Or oh, you can read it. Sorry, read it, read it. Matthew chapter 7, 21 to 23. Matthew chapter 7, uh, reading from verse 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in the day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me. You who practice lawlessness. Yes. So here, what is it saying? You know, he's saying that uh, you can do many good things, and then you think you're going to get a reward when you stand before God, and then he's you're going to be shocked because all that you have done is you have done it by your own will, but you have disappointed God, and he says, I never knew you depart from me. What is lawlessness? Lawlessness actually is a, you know a state of moral or spiritual rebellion against God. Okay, When you're spiritually or morally rebelling against God, against his commandments, against his uh, principles, okay? Or it's an idea where an individual is basically, you know, engaging in immoral or sinful behavior. And even though they know that God is displeased with them, their, uh, their, their behavior is, uh, they're acting in basically in defiance of God's, law so that is lawlessness so for us it is impossible for us to do many good things in his name but not have a personal relationship with the king okay it's also for us uh, to do many good things but you know uh, 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 be someone who practices lawlessness which means we're doing what we think is important what we think is right and good but we're totally defying god we are totally disobeying him and not doing his will. Okay. So anything that is not the will of God and is not bo born out of a relationship with God, you know, even though if it's done in God's name, even though it seems to be right and perfect and good and something that will build God's kingdom, it is still called lawlessness. Okay. So um, uh, too often, you know, we can get we uh, in ministry, you know, we can get so caught up in doing projects and programs, one program of the other, you know, one conference after the other, do a lot of things in the name of God, but, you know, not know, not uh, first asking God whether we should be doing what we are doing, whether we should do this conference, whether we should, you know, uh, be in, uh, uh, doing this program. I like uh, one of the church pastors, you know, having the biggest church in India here, in, in South India. You know, he came here to Bangalore and had a conference. And something that he said, you know, you know stayed in my mind. He said, uh, you know, the first six months of the year as a church, they fast and pray for the next six months of mission work or ministry work. First six months, prayer. Next six months of the year, ministry and mission and i think that is so right that is so powerful because unless you are soaked in the presence of god you can't carry his presence his power his authority into the uh, you know into the ministry field and it's the power that gives us the anointing the backing and the leading and also the direction what we need to do when we need to uh, do it where we need to go and preach and teach so important 
Okay. And also this something this pastor said stuck in my mind. He said, you know, he never takes commitments to preach anywhere on Sunday. He is there in his church to preach on Sunday. And it's a very famous man. He's the biggest church in, in India. He says, you know why? Because if I don't feed my sheep, who will feed my sheep? If I don't take care of my sheep, who will take care of she my sheep? I shouldn't be running around taking care of other people's sheep and shepherd. I must be taking care of my own sheep and shepherd. So, so right in his way and method of kingdom building. So sometimes it's so important for us to get things right. In the, other than just running into conferences and programs and everything, you know, wait on God, listen to him, spend time in prayer. Sometimes we think oh, six months, what a waste of time. You know, but it's not. See, Jesus, 30 years waited, three years of powerful ministry. Before that, three years, 40 days in the wilderness fasting and praying. What a powerful, um, what, the, you know, uh, two and, uh, uh, two, the, sorry, two and uh, less years of ministry. So powerful. Why? Because did it in the right way. Okay. We'll come back after the break and continue. Thank you, everyone.